Welcome to User's Guide to the Soul. We're so glad to have you. It's Temple Israel's Kabbalah class, and you're joining, really, there's over 15,000 hours of viewing happening this month on all our Kabbalah classes. So a really big uh, amount of energy and time, people coming and learning with us on all our Kabbalah classes. I hope you'll join us and keep coming back. We're in the Tanya, that is uh, one of the most profound, one of the most profound Kabbalistic texts that's ever been brought down. And we're in an amazing section we just started last week that is talking about awe and love, reverence and love as two wings that will help us elevate all of our Jewish activities, all any mitzvah we do, any anything we learn. And we're talking about now splitting them up and looking at each one on its own and the first point the Alter Rebbe made is, first of all, when we talk about Yira, let's call it Yira, and welcome to everyone who's with us on Facebook. I see we've got nine people watching, so uh, I'm going to try and follow the comments here. And so if you have any questions, please uh, go ahead and write comments here. I'm going to add my, uh, my little hello. There you go. So I'll watch your comments and bring them into the conversation. And a few more people coming into our Zoom. If you'd like to join our Zoom, email uh, maya at temple-israel.org, and she'll send you the link for future Zooms. So we've been looking at, first of all, let's define what Yira is. Because often we call it fear, so we're not going to use that word as much. I'd rather use awe or reverence or respect, because there are also even better translations of Yira. And we ask the question, fear of what? Because often we hear that word yira and we think, oh, isn't that, isn't that just for kids? You know, you'll be punished by God. We're not talking about fear of punishment. In fact, nowhere in this chapter does the Alter Rebbe describe fear of punishment. It never brings it up. And as you'll see when we get to the end of this chapter, fear of punishment is the exact opposite of the kind of yira the Alter Rebbe is describing. Spoiler alert, because what is fear of punishment? I'm worried about me. I'm self-centered. And the whole point of Yira is to get myself started in a relationship by stepping out of myself, by being worried about what the other wants. So whether that's respect in a marriage, and I'm doing something because why, why would I do something my wife doesn't want if I respect her? Not that I'm afraid she's going to yell at me or, or there'll be a consequence. I just want... I wouldn't do that. I respect her. Of course I wouldn't do it. I'm afraid to do something she doesn't want me to do. I have too much reverence for her. As opposed to, if I'm worried about some punishment that's going to happen, that's about me. So Yura, as we'll learn, it's all about getting into the mindset of the other, doing something for someone else, and making myself small. And fear of punishment, uh, you know, that, that's, that's nothing to do with, uh, with, with that whole flow. Um, yeah, and thank you, Noreen. We also use the word amazement, amazement for Euro. That's a good one, too, if you like. And uh, as we're reading, you'll see students are actually putting in their own uh, favorite word for Euro as we're going along. So we're going to we're gonna be free with a translation on that word. We also looked at, uh, we looked at a, an example of why it is that the Alter Rebbe says at the beginning of this chapter, of the two, of awe, and love, which is important to have first, which is foundational, right? Which which you need to start with so you can build the other one on. He said, absolutely, 100%, one has to start with reverence or awe. You have to start with reverence or awe. And it's not that one is more important than the other once you have both. You need both. You can't have awe on its own. But if you start with love, as we'll see, the love actually is not genuine and doesn't flow. If you start with awe, now you can also build love on top of that. And we talked about, say, say I came home for dinner uh, with, with, my, with my wife, my partner, and I came home three hours late without saying anything, without calling, and I had a bouquet of roses in my hand because I'm a romantic guy and I know she loves roses. She's been sitting there while looking at the cold food for three hours. How much love is she going to feel from my beautiful bouquet of roses? <laughs> Right? And we, so we won't, we won't discuss the whole thing, but we're all smiling and shaking our heads, right? The first thing you know about relationships is if the respect is gone, then the love is not flowing either. You need to make space for the other person. I needed to stop and say, sorry, honey, I'm going to be late. Something big came up. Uh, you know, please put it in the oven. 
pull myself back and make space for her. And only then, after I've done that, now the love can flow and be received. And same thing with the Ain Sof. We, we're establishing that same relationship where the first step is putting myself in the mindset of the other, having respect for the other. Oh, Jack is here. Amazing. Hi, Jack. And only then do we build love on top of that. Um, and let's let's go on. Let's go. Let's go straight into where we were. We're here on page 598. And the Altar Rebbe is now giving us an active meditation. This is Hit Boinanut. This is Hit Boinanut. That is Jewish meditation. And this is a specific meditation, a general meditation for us to begin to generate this amazement or awe or reverence that we're talking about so that it can flow into and help elevate all of the other things we do torah mitzvahs whatever whatever it is we do at temple israel as jews and the first part of the meditation was you have to bear in mind that the beginning of serving god its root nothing else happens until you've done this and it has to do with not just the things i shouldn't do in Judaism, but also even the positive mitzvahs. I'm going, I'm going yeah, to give. I can't talk to you. I'm going to have a coin in a tzedakah box. I'm at a class. The first thing that I want to do is make sure there's a little bit of awe flowing, not just love, right? And that is, I want to imagine, and as much as I can, picture in my mind as in the content of my meditation, that God is absolutely infinite. That God is creating the world, flowing within the world with light, surrounding the world with a transcendent light. And that as much as I can picture in my limited mind that absolute infiniteness of God, before whom the whole world is nothing, basically. And then now we're getting to part two of the meditation. Once I've established in my mind that I'm dealing with as much as I can grasp, which is very little, but as much as I can grasp, I'm dealing with an absolute infinite light. Now I want to focus on how that infinite light is focusing on me watching what I'm doing and actually wanting me and needing me, in fact, to accept what the Ain Self wants, what the infinite light wants. So part one, the greatness of God, as much as I can fit into my limited brain. And then part two, wow, so that, that, that infinite one we're talking about is paying direct attention to me and even wants and needs me to say yes, I'm gonna I'm gonna do I'm gonna do what it is you want. I'm not gonna do the opposite of what you want. And directly standing right here in front of me, paying complete attention to me, and not just to my actions and words and thoughts, but to even my inner intentions, to my my heart and, and my kidneys and my guts, knowing everything about me. And as you, if if you're like me, then as you say this, you start to feel a sense of. Wow, is that is it true that I, I have I wasn't alone this morning while I was getting ready for this class? God was watching how carefully I'm preparing. Is it true that even the dreams that I had, it's not just my own private business. God's watching, seeing, you know, um, what exactly is floating around in my subconscious. Every part of me, God is paying direct attention to and wanting me to do the right thing. It fills me with what we're calling a sense of yura. And maybe I'm not I'm not I'm not running uh, around in circles out of fright, but it's in my mind and it's in my heart. And as we'll see, that's enough. So part two, top of six hundred. Umania chelonim v'tachtonim. Go ahead, Maxine. You can unmute. Yet he leaves aside the creatures of the higher worlds and the creatures of the lower world. Right, so we've uh, we've uh, learned all about you know these many spiritual worlds and the angels that live in them and matat and all these other businesses, and even though those are so much loftier than us, God says nah, that that wasn't the point. That wasn't the point. I'm not even I'm not even interested in those heavenly worlds and and angels. I'm looking right at you, right directly at you, a physical being, a tiny little speck on Earth, and I'm watching what you're doing. I'm not interested in those heavenly worlds. He uniquely bestows his kingship upon his people Israel in general, for God is known as the king of Israel, and upon him in particular, for a man is obligated to say, for my sake, 
was the world created. Now this, uh, so, so look at the idea. This infinite God is paying attention to me and saying, uh, no, I'm not concerned about the heavens and the angels. I want to have you do the right thing. I want to have you do what I want, small ash. <laughs> That, that, that's filling me with even more awe, that, that basically God's saying that to me all the time. You know, I, ha I have an idea of right and wrong, God's saying, and I have given you free will, and now I need you to follow what's right and wrong. Right? It's all written in these books. Learn it, and now go do it. And I'm watching you, and I need you to do it. And that, that's happening all the time. And he says, the quote is, For my sake was the world created. That's what I should say. And that's a quote from, uh, he says, Mesecta Sanhedrin. And, and the mission describes that why did God create humanity as one being initially? Before Adam and Eve were split, it was a composite being. So all the other animals were created uh, in pairs or, or in groups or teeming groups. Only humanity was created as one being. One being. And it's exactly for this, because when there was that one being, there was no one else to blame it on. Right? If we had to fix something, it was just me. I was responsible for that whole world. Right? My little spark of a soul that's contained in Adam and Eve still understands that, right? So that one first being, that was it. They impacted absolutely everything. They were responsible for absolutely everything. And the world was created for them to go and do the right thing and fix it. And it was clear. I mean, when God's paying attention to what human beings are doing, God was just paying attention to them. Now, since there's millions of other people, maybe I can say, well, I see something in front of me that needs fixing. You know, I'm going to let uh, David or Susan go and fix it, right? There's many of us, but we want to avoid that. We want to take this very personally. We want to say, even though there's many of us, we were created as one being to show us everything I do impacts the whole world. Everything I do impacts the whole world. That should be my attitude. And as we've learned... There's sparks of the world to repair that only I can repair. No one else can get into my, uh, my, my piece of the pie chart of what needs to be repaired. And I have a comment, and no one is better than anyone. Sorry, my comments are done. Noreen, you want to you wanna say that out loud? I missed that. And no one is better than anyone else. Absolutely. Yeah. So even if it seems like maybe... Uh, I'm I'm you know I'm at I'm at uh, level level B and someone else is at level level uh, J. Uh, I've got my work and and I uh, I have my tests and they have their work and their tests and who knows who's doing better on their on their curriculum. So that's this next part of the meditation. Not only is there this infinite being, the infinite being is not paying attention to all these lofty worlds. Is paying direct attention to me and wants me to have a sense that this whole world was created for me. Everything I do impacts the whole world. And us, v'hukam hu mekabel alav malchuto, liot melech alav, ulav do, v'lasot ritzono b'chol minei avodat avid. And he, for his part, accepts his kingship upon himself, that he be king over him to serve him and do his will in all kinds of servile, servile work. And we discussed this a little last week. In Judaism, there's the concept of Ein Melech Bloam. There's no king without a nation. So a king can't be a dictator. A king can't come and say, I'm big, I'm strong, I'm your king. We actually have to accept the king. It's up to us to accept the king. So this part is important. We, ourselves, have to accept that Malchut. Right? God comes and says, I actually created the world, I rule the world, this is the right and wrong, this is what should happen. Here's your free will. And now for God to actually, for that malchut of God to be satisfied, to land, I have to accept it the way we do every year on, on Rosh Hashanah, we blow the shofar. And God actually needs me, crazy, that, it, that a, limited, a limited created being, God needs me to accept God's kingship for it to actually connect. Again, if, if you sit... And, and meditate on this for five, 10 minutes in the morning, as you'll see uh, it's meant to be. Now we're getting a, a more and more sense of awe that this, you know, the day in front of me is not just a, uh, not just a, uh, you know, something to enjoy and to experience. It actually is a challenge and it is, and, and it is a, a relationship with God and it is, you know, God watching what we're doing and how we're doing it and, and assessing. So it fills me again with more and more uh, reverence and awe for 
every moment in the day and every word that I'll say to the people around me and every opportunity that comes my way that I, that I can uh, be part of or miss. Let's go on. Vihine, ah, and it keeps going, right? Vihine, Hashem nitzav alav, muloch al aretz kvado, umabit alav. And behold, God himself stands over him, and the whole world is full only with his glory. And not only being omnipresent does he see everything, but moreover, he scrutinizes, he scrutinizes him in particular. I mean, now I want to run, you know what I mean? <laughs> I do have a little bit of, a little bit of, uh, you know, just actual fear now reading this, right? And it's not just that God is thinking about me, paying attention to me somewhere off in the heavens, you know, and God's infinite ability to pay attention is including me in that. God's actually standing right over me. The whole world is full of this, what we call God's glory, God's kavod, right? The, 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 the illumination of this transcendent light. And yet, God's not somewhere else. God's standing right here, right now, looking at me and checking, as we'll see. But let's look at this beautiful uh, quote that he pulls. It's from, it's from the story of Jacob's dream with the ladder, right? So this is, it's just very inspiring language as well that we're including in this meditation. This is from, Behine Hashem Nitzav Alav is from uh, Jacob's dream about the ladder, where there was this, this ladder with angels uh, going up and coming down, and God was standing on the ladder and in the midrash rashi has two opinions one is god is standing on the ladder so here's jacob looking up the ladder and god's at the top and the other is jacob's god is standing on jacob right the language allows for both so god in this instance could be on the ladder or on jacob <clears throat> and uh, the midrash goes on to say that that's kind of the dichotomy between uh, you know, a, a Rasha and a Tzaddik, as we learned, a, a self-centered person and a completely other-centered person. For Rashaim, they stand on their gods. It's the opposite. Excuse me. <coughs> and for Tzaddikim, God stands on them. God stands on them. So, of course, that could mean this meditation, God's right, right on me, looking right down over me, and I want to keep that in mind to keep this awe being generated. But uh, the last Rebbe of this system also said, you know, God standing on me, that's a sense of God depending on me, right? God is, God is actually counting on me for malchus of atzilus to flow into the world because I have to accept that malchus. I have to say, yes, God's watching me and I want to do what God wants and not the opposite. And when I generate that awe, now I came through for God who is depending on me. Make sense? Yeah. What's the question, Rick? Uh... The rabbi, uh, the author rabbi is not saying here that God can actually see inside our heart, correct? A hundred percent. That is, that okay. is, that is, earlier I think that is in, universally earlier, understood. Er, earlier in the time, you know, we talked about that in order for a prayer to be going up, it has to be said out loud. Yeah. Aren't those two contradictory? Yeah, they are. Yeah, we, we, we talked about how that's that's kind of puzzling, that why is it we have to say prayer out loud? Because God if, does if, in if our minds. Heart. Heart. Yeah, and the reason the reason God needs prayers need to be said out loud uh, to review is not, not because God doesn't know when I say them in my mind or my heart, God's well aware, but because for me, I want to connect that prayer or learning to my physical body to elevate it. And so when I say it physically, now it plugs into my physical body and I start elevating the animal soul, right? So it's really for my sake, uh, not, you know, not entirely for my sake, God also wants a home in the lowest realms, as we said, God wants a dira bitachtonim. And so when I speak, I create that home for God in the physical part of my reality. So it's also for God, and primarily for God. But it's not because God doesn't know when I'm saying the Shema in my heart or my mind. God's well aware of all that. Yeah, and it's a complicated topic. You know, we could, we could, we could. I don't want to go back over the whole thing, but, okay. but of, right. yes, a hundred percent. God, every vision of God in Judaism, God is aware of everything about me inside and out. Uh, so, so, God's well aware of, of all my all my uh, motivations. So there's silent prayer. So, how does it fit? It doesn't fit into me. I'm having my brain is going. 
ground with it. Yeah, yeah. So, the, uh, you know, I think it's just terms. So what, what we do at Temple when we have silent prayer is we're not speaking at all. And we're going to a meditative space, hopefully, in whatever way we can. And then we, we're having a focus for that of directing our heart to God or, or focusing on, on a particular uh, kavana, uh, uh, an intention of mindfulness or holiness. And so that really is, we're calling it silent prayer, but I'd like us to think of it in this class as hit bonanut, as meditation. Um, and it's just a bit of a confusion of terms because in the traditional world, when you do the silent amida, you're meant to speak it very quietly, right? So you would say, uh, you know, like you'd speak at about that level, right? So it's it's really meant to be spoken very quietly to yourself, but still pronounced. Whereas actual not saying anything of any volume, that's that's hit bonanut. That is what we're learning to do here. So me, when when we get to uh, the, those silent prayer moments at Temple Israel, I use that when I'm leading or when I'm attending as a, a chance to engage in hit bonanut in this meditation. And it might be this very meditation to now create these emotions that will propel the rest of my prayers when I'm speaking. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's, yeah, yeah, that does. And searches. And searches his reins and heart, that is, his innermost thoughts and emotions, to see if he is serving him as is fitting. So that's that's what's happening. And that, that makes it land so deeply for me that it's not just that there's this infinite being that I can have some relationship with. And it's not just that that infinite being is ignoring all the celestial worlds and angels to pay attention to, to tiny me. And it's not just that that infinite being needs and wants me to do the right thing and, and follow what what they want. Ratzon Elyon, right? The, the Keter of, of uh, Atsilus, basically. I, I'm, I'm having a relationship with like, you know, the highest sphera of the highest world as it is in Ainsof. But still, God is standing right over me and actually looking inside my innards and my heart to see if I'm really doing it as is fitting. To see if I'm really doing it in the proper way. Whether I, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm just sort of phoning it in or whether I'm really a sense of like, yes, this is what God wants, so I'm going to do it. And I'm going to do it with every part of me. And is aware, aware of, of at what level I'm serving. That's that to me becomes uh, quite awe-inspiring. You know, it's a basic idea. God's looking at, you know, everything inside me. You know, I know when I do something and, and I'm trying to do the right thing, but somehow I know in my guts it's the wrong thing, you know? Or or I'm like, I, I'm, I'm having a moment where I'm being weak and I, I'm maybe being, uh, God forbid, dishonest or, 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 or being not nice to someone. And I feel something in my guts. It's like, ooh, I'm letting myself down. That, that's what God's looking at. God's looking at, our, our, our gut brain, our, our instinctive mind, to know whether we're really, you know, right down to our core doing it because it's the right thing and God wants it. That, that's, that's, it's just a very, very basic feeling, right? And Sue Ellen? Oh, sorry, uh, Maxine, go ahead. Therefore, if you want to unmute. Therefore, he must serve in his presence with awe and fear. Example notes the Rebbe, not merely like one who was located in the king's domain, but moreover, like one standing before the king. I right, so and that's that's the... Oh, sorry, that is the end of the meditation, that after all that, now I want to picture that I want to serve God with this yura, as if I'm literally standing not just in this king's chamber or this queen's chamber, but right in front of the king directly. But that's, of course, I'm going to be motivated to do the right thing. I'll be in a very high functioning state. I'm going to always uh, be honest and be kind and think about the other person and, and be prompt and get up and do the right thing and help help all those around me. Of course I will if literally this king is standing right in front of me. And uh, this is more than just a, 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 you know, a beginning of a chapter. This is a very special section of the Tanya, you should know, um, that uh, the last Rebbe of the system, so the, the seventh disciple of the Altar Rebbe, or six generations later, he recommended to many, many people 
to memorize this section of the Tanya, this up until this point in the chapter, because it's so key in our service. It's the first thing we need to do in our service. And as you'll see, you're actually meant to engage in it every single morning before you begin your basic work as a Jewish person, whatever your morning practice is. And then to come back to every time I do learning or a mitzvah, every time I do learning or a mitzvah, the Alter Rebbe is going to, uh, is going to, uh, you know, go in and, and, and go through that now. But this really is, if you've been with us for the months, you've learned the, the, the long, short path of meditation. This is the first module, so to speak, that I'm supposed to insert into our system of meditation right in the morning so that as the Alter said, the first thing I'm going to have is a sense of amazement and reverence. And then I can build love on top of that. And now I'll have two very powerful wings to elevate anything that I do. So let, let's go through. And, uh, you know, I, I've, I, you know, I'll digress a little. I, I've taken a few trips to uh, the, the, what's called the Ohel, the, uh, the resting place of the last Rebbe of this system. As you know, uh, just an amazing energy there. I don't know what to say. And uh, sometimes they'll have videos going uh, of, of, you know, classes and talks that, that, uh, that the Rebbe gave. And one time I came in, and it was years ago, and I walked in, and it was like the Rebbe stopped, and he just said, and you should memorize this in chapter 41. <laughs> I was like, what, me, what? <laughs> so I took it as a, you know, maybe, maybe a little bit of a, a, a nod and a wink of the universe, and I came and I, I, I memorized this. And I, I do believe, you know, my sense is that uh, it makes me really uh, more committed, more able to serve others around me, and more able to express the chesed side in an other-centered way if I start with this place of yira and I really use this meditation to generate that that awe uh, to start my practice each day. So let's go on. V'yamik b'machashava zo v'yarich ba k'fi yochelet hasagat mocho machashavto u'k'fi hapnai shelo. I think, uh, Eleanor, will you, uh, yeah, one okay. must meditate, one must meditate profoundly and at length on this concept, according to the capacity of apprehension of his brain and thought and the time available to devote to this comp contemplation, this time being. So now this is, here's where the rubber hits the road, and, and we're meant to be meditators, right? So for, for anyone watching uh, on Facebook or in the future, this is one of, the, one of the, the most primary and completely authentic, uninterrupted systems of Jewish meditation we have. It goes right back to the Baal Shem Tov and, and to his teachers, and it's not, uh, not uh, altered in any way by any, uh, any sort of... Uh, Outside ideas or Eastern meditation. This is this is Jewish meditation handed down directly from the Baal Shem Tov through the Alter Rebbe. That we should sit as we learn. We should use breathing to clear our mind. Then we should introduce this divine concept, this meditation. And Yamik means we go deeply. It's not just a superficial meditation where I hold it in my mind, uh, kind of a superficial way, and maybe I'm thinking other thoughts, and it's you know only the surface of my mind. But Yamik means go deeply deeply right have you ever uh, been very very upset about something someone said 20 years ago <laughs> and and something happens you get reminded and then you go you don't you don't go superficially into that into that resentment meditation you go deeply right oh i'm right there i'm feeling feelings i just want to i want to go and tell them this and that i might half an hour goes by and i didn't even notice it because i'm so engaged that's deeply if we can do it with a frustration meditation we can do it with uh, a, 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 a awe meditation, and we can go in just as deeply. Bimachashavazo, on this this uh, contemplation, v'yarichba, and you should do it for an extended amount of time. Because as we've learned, when I meditate on something, I get feelings about it. If I meditate on baseball, I get excited about baseball, and someone brings it up, and suddenly I'm animated, I have feelings. Same thing about the greatness of the Ein Sof, and my relationship with the Ein Sof and how the Ein Sof is looking right at me, wanting me to accept that, that will and watching my, my mind and my guts, right? The more time I spend focusing deeply on it, 
the more profound will be the awe that I generate, the amazement that I generate, and then the higher my Torah and mitzvahs will go when, I, when I'm out in the world doing stuff. Any questions about that? That's, that's such a key piece. That's the whole, that's the work we do now. We get it, yeah? Now we just want to do it. Uh, before I Go ahead, go ahead. Before he engages in the study of Torah, or before the performance of a commandment, such as before putting on his talit or tefillin. So why does the Alter Rebbe pick these examples? Because he's going to say you want to do it before every single mitzvah, or any learning. But he picks, his, he picks this because what do you do traditionally at the beginning of the day? You put on a talus, you put on tefillin, that's the start of your day. And so you really want to take your main time to engage in this meditation before if you put on a talus and say the Shema, or if you happen to put on tefillin and say the Shema, in the morning before you start, and B, because that's a weekday activity. So we should know that it's not just on Shabbat and on Yom Tov, that we go deep into it and, and engage in meditation and create these uh, and create these uh, women. So question, how do women engage? Women also pray. So absolutely, in the morning before praying, there's many, many women I know who, who will engage in the same meditation. Um, but they don't, they don't need to put on tefillin. You know, that's, that's something that's available for women to do. And some, some women in the forum movement do, but it's not, not more commonly practiced, I think. But any time before you're praying. And by the way, from the context of this uh, text, uh, and I'll, I'll go, I'll go, uh, you know, uh, 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 heterosexual here. So traditionally, a husband and a wife, or any married couple, they're considered one being already. So I, I know it's a little bit of a cop out, but when I get up and I put on uh, a talus or I put on tefillin and I start praying, my my wife Jen is also doing it because we're not considered two separate people anymore. So uh, that's not that's not kind of an answer that. You know the reform movement kind of likes but like spiritually inside there is a reality to it that, that that i'm having in mind my whole family and my wife and that we're one being and that it's not like i get to do this and she doesn't it's not that at all yeah but i think there's more than more than just a, a temporal uh reasoning for for the these um the talus and the and the talit I mean, the, the talus and, and and the tefillin is that that both of these are 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 physically are physical acts and they are wrapping, they're binding and they're wrapping. Um, and so, I mean, it's like, you know, similarly, so I can, I can, I can see why some, some women would be like, you know, just, just like, you know, the, the question of like, well, why don't I just think my prayers? Um, isn't that, just, you know, and so because, and, and the, the answer is because there's, there's this, this physicality, um, this, this realization that happens when things are said out loud. Similarly, you know, I think there is the physicality of of, of putting on, on on a talus or or, or, or putting on tefillin um, that is very, um, you know, um, the, it, it's very it's very it binds one to God. I mean, it is it is like the reins of 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 of, of God. Yeah, and you're actually you're actually preempting the Rebbe, the altar of his next point. So you're getting into his line of thinking for sure. So that's he's about to go there, as you'll see. In exactly your point. Uh... So yeah, so this is this is the morning. It's starting it off. As you're, he'll say, he'll get into the specifics soon. It's weekday, not yontif. And so the first part was. Let's go through the meditation again. The first part was on the greatness of God that God's paying attention to me. So that should create one awe. Now the second piece uh, is that the mitzvah itself will lead to awe, right? That I, that when I put on a talis and and. I think that that is God's will. When I when I put on tefillin, or or when I uh, do any, any any of those morning mitzvahs, that itself recognizing that that is God's rutzon, that will fill me with awe, as we'll see. Ratzon Go ahead, Eleanor. I'm even waiting. <laughs> <laughs> All right. He should also reflect how the light of the blessed Ein Sof, which encompasses all worlds and pervades all worlds, and which is identical with the higher will. So that what is Or Ein Sof? It is Ratzon, it is the will of the Ein Sof. It's the same thing. So when we say, oh, God wants something, that's actually what the Or Ein Sof is. So when I'm putting on tefillin or a talis or, any, or doing any physical mitzvah, that's, I'm actually dealing with 
the or ain't self itself. It's right there. And when I meditate on that, that also will fill me with awe, with the sense that this isn't just some 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 fabric. This is actually God's will right here that I'm that I'm handling with my hands. And that's a second piece that that will strengthen that awe that I've generated. Humulubash beotiot v'chokma tatora. It's clothed in the letters and wisdom of the Torah. And the same thing when I'm when I'm learning. Right now, when we're learning, I could look at it as just a book with some ink, or I could say this: that is the orange self is right there. I'm I'm able to look at it with my eyes, hold it with my hands, speak it with my voice, and and what an awe-inspiring meditation that now I'm able to handle the orange self, which the highest spiritual beings can't even get near. They would be dissolved. It's so powerful. That's God's actual rutzon. That's keter. It's the highest sphera <laughs> of the world of Atzilus. Right? No one, no, one can, no one can approach that level, and yet, I just pick it up, and it's right there. That's a feeling of dread and awe, perhaps. Or if his, <clears throat> if his meditation takes place before he puts on his tally and tefillin, he should contemplate how the divine will is closed in these tzitzit and tefillin, it being God's will that a Jew wear them. And through his recitation or study of the Torah, or by his wearing tzitzit and tefillin, who mamshich oro yibarech alav dahinu al chelik eloah mimal she betoch gufo. Go ahead, Suellen. Let's keep going. Let's keep going in this order, Suellen. We'll we'll go right around. Oh, sorry, Maxine. Go ahead. And he, he draws at the bottom. He draws upon himself his blessed light that is over the part of God above. Which abides which abides in his body, right? <clears throat> and animates it. So the light of God that I draw on myself when I'm doing a mitzvah, it actually is drawn on my divine soul. It's drawn into and on my divine soul, that, that it is a piece of God. And when I contemplate that, what Torah mitzvah really is, that should fill me with a sense of awe. It does for me. Um, this he does with the intent that it may be absorbed and nullified in his blessed light. Yeah, I think, Doreen, you may have you may have some of the screen missing. Let, let's, let's keep going with Eleanor next uh, so everybody, everybody can participate. So it may be absorbed and nullified in, in God's light that my divine soul actually will be like that candle within the ball of the sun, within the orb of the sun that we discussed way at the beginning, that really has no existence of its own. Once the orange self is drawn over my divine soul, the divine soul is just nullified, and I have this oneness with the ain't self that, 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 again, is enough to fill me with awe. And now we're going to go to what Alex brought up, which is the details of the mitzvah. So part one of the meditation is the general meditation of awe. Part two is how the mitzvah itself, that's actually God's will, Ratzon Elyon, which is the Ain Self, and I'm holding it right in my hands. I'm speaking it out of my mouth. And then part three is now the details of the mitzvah itself can also lead to awe because each one has a different quality. Yeah, so uh, Eleanor, let's go with you. V'derech prat bitfilin. Specifically through tefillin, he should intend that the attributes of wisdom and understanding, which are in his divine soul, should be nullified and absorbed into the attributes of wisdom and understanding of the blessed Ein Sal. These being clothed, in particular, in the passages of Kaddish, Bahaya, Ki, Ki uh, Right. Yeah, so the, the idea of tefillin is that my Chochmah bin and Dat is merged or blended with the Chochmah bin and Dat of the Ein Sof. That's the idea. So I'm taking God's God's 
intellect. I'm taking God's Chokhma and Bina, but God's Chokhma, these Torah scrolls, and putting them right in front of my eyes, right on my arm to bind my heart to. And now my insight, my ability to analyze, and my uh, and my uh, sense of connecting to emotionally connecting to knowledge, those three attributes, those are all now linked to these infinite sources of chokhmah, bina, and dad. And so, understanding the the ins and outs of the particular mitzvah, that also can fill me with in additional awe because my gosh. My 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 intellect is now merging, is now interfacing with divine intellect. That's a crazy thought. That I mean, imagine I'm doing a, a Vulcan mind meld with the Ain Sof, right? This is this is uh, it, it, it's quite it's quite uh, awe inspiring to me, as I keep saying. Um, and and you look at the details; it's beautiful because there's four compartments of the head to fill in, and each one of those texts links to either Chokhmah, Bina. And then dot contains both chesed and gevura. Dot, my my uh, sense of knowledge, uh, as we've as we've explained, it it can, it holds both love and awe in it. So there's two passages that refer to that, and each one lines up with that aspect of the divine intellect. So as you're putting on tefillin, if that's what you do, that's again an amazing piece. A third section of the meditation where the structure of the mitzvah itself can fill us with additional awe. Yeah, any any thoughts on that? Yeah, I have a quick a quick question. So in that in, in in that we are nullifying those parts of of ourselves. I mean in in this act does do the names of God that are associated with um like uh uh Chachma and Bina um no, notably Yah and Elohim are they too um through this process um, nullified and absorbed into the Ein Sof. Oh, so I mean, you know, whether whether the names the names are one with the Ein Sof, right? So I mean, that that's an interesting question. Uh, you know, I mean, you can you can bring the names into the meditation. There's many many dimensions you could bring in, and that that's a hundred percent part of it. If you got if you got sort of the bandwidth to include that, it's beautiful. Um, you know, the, the name. I think I believe the names are united with the Ein Sof, no matter what, right? I mean. That, that's, I think everything's united with the Ansof, no matter what. I mean, ultimately. Yeah, yeah, but the names don't have any, don't have any like like uh, I think, kind of self conscious separateness like we do as created beings. I mean, the, the name is is one with the Ansof, the same way the Sirot are one with the Ansof. So so a hundred percent, they're always united with the Ansof. I think is the answer. It's a high octane question there. Yeah. So he's very sexist. I'm sorry. It's cultural. <laughs> he was 19th century. He couldn't conceive of women being involved in this. He just couldn't. And I don't blame him for it. That was his outlook. But it is very sexist. And people are, you know, there's a lot of single people. Uh, you don't have to join with your husband. People are single now. You know what I mean? He's yes, to understand. And so I present, I present those uh, insights yeah. Something to consider, but I, I would never uh, argue with someone that said, according to the former movement, this page here it has sexist language. It's directed towards men. It's you know, it's gender specific. Yeah. There's no question. So on the one hand, you know, my strategy is to get get what we can out of it, accepting okay. that that you know it's from its time and, and no question. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I you know I give you these insights to consider. But you yeah. gotta work around it. <laughs> if you like, absolutely. <laughs> I think Sharon. Are we on that is to say? Correct, yes. That is to say that he should use the wisdom and understanding that are in his soul for God alone, only in pursuit of Torah and mitzvah and for understanding godliness. So that that is the result. If I if I am merging or blending or connecting my my sechel, my intellect, <clears throat> with the intellect of the Ein Sof, now the whole point of my intellect is to figure out not how I can get the tastiest dessert, how I can get the nicest house, how I can get uh, the biggest paycheck. It's to figure out how can I serve God, how can I help the people around me, how can I improve myself so that I'm a better servant of God. Uh, how can how can I fix the world? And that's the only thing my intellect should be engaged in, because now it's it's got uh, the intellect of the Ein Sof 
connected to it. Yes, Sharon? How, how I can be a better person. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. And 604, similarly, So I think we're at, uh, let me go to my gallery. Linda, would you like to read for us? Have you got the text? If you want to unmute, thanks. Similarly, he should uh, instead intend that the attribute of Da'at, the third of the three components of intellect in his soul, which includes both the chesed, kindness, and gavura, severity, fear and love in his heart. Right, so that chesed and gavura are the fear or the awe and the love of my heart. So that dot, that knowledge, that's what makes me feel something about information. And I can either feel love or I can feel uh, amazement and awe. So I want that aspect of dot to also be uh, uh, also be uh, included in that in that unity with God's dot, and that it be nullified. <speaking in Hebrew> Um, Jack or Paula, do you guys want to read? Have you got the text? Paul, why don't you go and Jack, let us know if you can. Let, let me know if you can join in. Oh, I am unmuted. I didn't know that. Okay. He nullified and absorbed into the attribute of the higher knowledge, dot, Elyon, which comprises kindness and severity, and which is clothed in the passage of Shema and Baha'ya in Shamoa. Right, so those are those are the passages that uh, that that bring up love and awe, right? Shman vehafta is obvious. That's love. You'll love God, and ve'am shemo. If you follow these commandments, right, then you're not going to be. So that that's the one that refers to fear of not punishment, but fear of chet, fear of sin. That sense we talked about. That if I have this relationship with this infinite God, and God's watching me directly and watching right inside my mind and my heart and my guts to see what I'm doing. Did you, never mind punishment. Why would I want to do the opposite of what God wants? Why would I want to lie to somebody or get angry at somebody or, or, or uh, you know, uh, not fulfill an obligation I took on as a Jewish person? I have so much respect for God, I just wouldn't think of it. That's 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 the the that's the text that connects to my sense of awe that should allow that to flow even more powerfully. But you know, and uh, Alex, if, do you have the text? Do you want to read this last one in English? This accords. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. Um, uh, I'm, we're on I'm, 604, I'm, second I'm paragraph. A, I'm, I'm, in a diff I'm, 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 in, I'm in a different version. Oh, you got that one. Okay. So I'll, I'll, I'll pass. Okay, Doreen, can you finish this off? This accords? This accords with the statement of the Shulchan Aruch that while putting on the tefillin, one should intend to make one's heart and brain subservient to God. Now that that's just plain Shulchan Aruch. That means that's halakha, that's Jewish law. That when you put on the tefillin, you're trying to make your, your heart and your brain, uh, you know, subservient, you know, to be like a servant, to be just, you know, God wants it, so I do it. doesn't matter what I want. It's about what God wants. That should be my intention. That's basic, basic halakha. And we see that follows this deeply Kabbalistic uh, uh, meaning and meditation, that even just the basic halachav when you put on tefillin is the same thought. Uh, let's let's actually uh, take the last few minutes to engage in our, our meditative system, our our, our uh, long short path, and uh, let's let's use this particular meditation. And I highly recommend. Let me just check. Let me check uh, our comments. Let's, let's actually. Uh, take the last few minutes to oh. engage in our, our meditative system. Our, our, our so I have a question. Uh, what about praying in your heart? I think we discussed that uh, uh, here. here. You know, that's been a question we've been looking at. That when you pray in your heart, God absolutely understands. But uh, as we learned in the previous three chapters, when I speak it, now I start elevating the physical world with that prayer. And that's what God wants. God wants a home for God's will in the physical world. So that's the advantage of saying a prayer rather than speaking in your heart. If you're with us, let's uh, 
find yourself in a comfortable position. Lengthen your spine. And let your breath deepen, just like we're going to go deeply into this meditation. We want our breath to flow deeply. And then if you can, be breathing through your nose, gracefully in and out. Let's start to even out the four stages of breath. So four counts for breathing in. Two, three, four. Stay inflated. Two, three, four. Release the breath through the nose. Two, three, four. And staying empty. Two, three. Continue that. In. Two, three, four. Let it fill you and stay there. Two, three, four. Back out through the nose. Two, three. Four, and nice and long and empty. Two, three. Keep doing that at your own pace. So these four stages of the breath that sometimes happen just in the blink of an eye, we're lengthening them, deepening them, evening them out. So it's the full expression of the breath, which is the first appearance of the soul and the physical. And if you can, let your belly swell out as you breathe in and pull back up to your diaphragm as you breathe out, if that's a comfortable or familiar process. And we're going to open up our wisdom gateway. This is just the preparatory stage for our Hit Bonanut, our meditation. Wisdom gateway is the space between the end of the in-breath and the beginning of the out-breath. So as you flow through your full breath cycle, there's a space between the end of the in-breath and the beginning of the out-breath. That is our wisdom gateway. Let's let that open very naturally. And sort of try and stay there through the rest of the breathing cycle. That's a spiritual uh, reality. And if you're not if you're not with us in real time, you can pause and take a few minutes to establish that wisdom gateway, or if it's ready to go, let's now introduce into our gateway this meditation, the Alta Rebbe's reverence meditation. That there's this infinite being, infinite light filling the world, surrounding the world. The world is full of the glory of that Ain Sof. And yet Ainsaf is saying, never mind all those heavenly creatures, I'm paying attention directly to you. Directly to me. Searching my mind and heart. Am I doing the right thing? Am I doing it in the right way? Am I doing it with total respect? And indeed is right here, standing right over us and even depending on us. Because I'm the only one that can bring God's ratzon into my share of the world, which is created just for me. And notice if there's an emotional flow of reverence or of awe that's being generated. I want to allow that to increase, allow that to be brighter, allow that to be stronger and fuller. As we said, that is, that is the root, that is the foundation of all of our service, and love will be built on top of that. Here's where we go deeper. If the images that have filled your mind with this meditation, if they're perhaps gray or dull, make them bright and sharp. Yeah, if there's no audio, allow the audio to fill in too. If there's spaces in your mind that aren't engaged, bring them in so that it fills your mind like a full cup of wine brimming to the top. If there's nothing in your mind but this meditation and the emotions that are being generated in your heart. This is, that's, you can stay in this meditation for as long as you like if you're uh, not in real time. If you're with us, please wiggle your toes and open your eyes. I really do suggest, let, let me finish. This is, uh, you know, it's not, it's not a class that you take and then, uh, you know, you, you, you have your notes somewhere. This really is something that, that is, powerful if it's done every day and it can be just as, as quick as that or even quicker but if we begin our day with this meditation 
Uh, I know that all of us here at Temple Israel and beyond anyone learning with us uh, online, there's many, many uh, thousands of views each month. Uh, I know that we, with our uh, awe and with our sense uh, of respect, will uh, absolutely elevate everything around us. As we finish, let's also dedicate uh, this learning to uh, all those in the state of Israel, that uh, this learning should help all those living in the state of Israel who need healing to heal. There should be unity in the state of Israel and safety, God willing, over the coming however long it takes. And uh, this learning should also serve to strengthen uh, those defending Israel and give them uh, success in what's to come. And thanks for joining us. i uh, love to see you uh, next time. Please let me know any questions on, uh, on our Facebook page or our YouTube page, and we'll see you very soon.